Welcome to EBS TV. Today we will be talking about heating for residential buildings. What are the needs, which system for which cost, their pros and their cons. Let me first explain why designing a good heating and cooling system is important for a climate like Melbourne. It is because heating and cooling represent an average of 59% of the total energy spent for a house in Melbourne. So energy-wise, it is important to have a good design for your heating and cooling system. There are different systems that take more or less space, which cost more or less money, and at the end, occupants will be more or less comfortable in their house. So, how to select a heating system? First, you should consider the climate. It could be warm, it could be mild, it could be cold. Hey, I'm here. All right. Second, the passive thermal properties. How good is the envelope of the building? So it is about insulation, how thick it is, the quality of the glazing, single, double or triple, how airtight is the building and so on. Third, the building function. And remember, we are only talking about residential and so no industrial fridge for affinage of the cheese or concert hall. In our case, it's a house where occupants heat, sleep, relax, and whatever they want to do in a house, we have to make sure that they will be always comfortable. <laughs> really? Number four, the performance of systems. So, we are looking at the mode of heat transfer, the response, the possibility of zoning, noise and health issues. Cost, of course, is a part of the selection with two different approaches. The initial cost, also called capital cost, which is how much it costs to install the system. And then you've got the running cost, which is how much it costs to use the system. And quite often you try to save on a capital cost and end up paying a lot for your running cost. Last, there are technical details to consider. For example, don't design a gas system if there is no gas available. Or don't design an underflow heating system if it's a concrete slab on the ground. It is just not possible. To add to the list, you should also consider if there are existing systems or conditions, the standards, the comfort required by the clients, but also their preferences between duct, slab or hydronic, so, to help out, let's meet our Grand Reporter, Albert Duduvet. Good morning, this is Grand Reporter Albert Duduvet and today we are in the apart apartment of Mr. Power. Mr. Power, from what I understand you have in-slab electric heating here, is that correct? Uh, that's right, son, have a look around. Here we are in the living room and you can't see any heaters anywhere because the heating is a coil in the concrete slab underneath our feet heats up the concrete slab, the heat rises up, it's nice and comfortable, toasty warm, and I don't need any moccasins on my feet. <laughs> because it's in the concrete slab, it has a, a high thermal mass, it takes a little bit of time to warm up, about a half a day, but once she's warm, nice, even, constant temperature. I can put the furniture wherever I want, it's healthy and comfortable, and there's no dust or drafts. So, do you have that same heating system throughout the whole apartment? <laughs> no, son. Well, it wouldn't, wouldn't make any sense to have a coil underneath the bed or the bathtub or the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So, what other systems do you have in these other rooms? Uh, I got a little... Yeah! Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, show you, I'll show you in a minute. I've got the little uh, electric space heaters, right? And they're positioned underneath the window so we don't get any condensation forming on the window and it produces a convection current in the room so the cold air comes down, touches the heater, rises up to the roof and spreads throughout the room and makes a nice consistent temperature everywhere. Nice. And how about here? How do you control the temperature of the coil in the slab? Oh, well, I've got a little thermostat over there on the wall with which I can control the temperature, and because it's electric, it's very accurate, very precise. I see. And last thing, Mr. Power, how much does that cost? Ah, oh, well, the little, the little uh, heaters are not too expensive to put in, but the slab heating did cost quite a bit more. 
But the real problem, to be honest, is the running costs. It does use a lot of electricity, and if electricity prices go up anymore, well, I think I'll be in trouble. It cost about $1,400 last year. Wow. So have you ever given any thought about um, producing your energy or looking at renewable energy? Oh, well, that's right, son. I did look at it. I had to look at putting under the vault, the vault of a the photovoltaic on the roof you see the array they call it i was going to put that up there but the problem was i needed too many of the panels you see but also the bigger problem was that because it's an apartment i don't own the roof it's the uh, the body corporate and they don't they're not interested they don't want anything to do with it so i'm stuck with it and uh I've just got to face the high electricity costs, unfortunately. I have to pay what I have to pay. Well, that's very unfortunate, but at least it's comfortable, right? <laughs> that's right, son. It's very comfortable, very toasty and warm under the feet. Thank you, Mr. Power. We were in the apartment of Mr. Power. This is Albert Duvet, back to studio. Is that it? I've got to go to the toilet, I think. We're done, Mr. Power. All right, thank you. Good. <laughs> Thanks, son. And let's summarize now the pros and cons for electric slab heating and electric panels. Electric panel, pros. It is reactive, cheap to install with a relatively accurate heat. There is no draft, very low maintenance, and zoning is possible. Cons, it is intrusive, it is quite expensive to run. If electricity prices go up, your bill goes up and you can't change the type of energy. You can heat only a small space or you need several panels for a big space. Electric coal in a slab. Pros. It is non-intrusive. It doesn't impact your furniture layout. Lots of inertia due to the thermal mass of the slab, so it offers a consistent temperature. Cons. It is not a reactive system, expensive to install and run. If electricity prices go up, your bill goes up and you can't change the type of energy. You can heat big space and zoning is possible with thermostat in each room. And now let's have a look at how to draw this system on a plan. This is the magic pen. <laughs> magic pen!
Thanks, the magic pen. And now let's meet our ground reporter, Charlotte O'Cream. Mother Nature gives me power from the sun, water for the flowers. It's my home with her, with her, with her son. Sorry. Sorry, Mum. I'm, I'm, I'm just in the middle of something. Yeah, no, I put them out. All right. Nothing. Hey. Hello, this is Charlotte O'Cream and I'm at the home of Mr. Water to talk to him about his home heating system. Hi, Mr. Water. Could you please tell me a little bit about your heating system? Yeah, sure, Charlotte. So um, here we have a hydronic uh, heating system with panels and a gas burner. Mm. Um, do you want me to, sh to, to show you? Oh, I love that. Yeah. Okay, so why don't I show you the gas over here? Um, so this is the gas inlet from the street, okay, it's running through the meter here. You can see the, li the line coming out, running into the house, to the other appliances. So this is the gas line here for the unit. It runs along here up to the, to the burner, it's a condensing burner. Also down here we have the, um, the cold water coming into the system just from the street. This is the ignition, uh, which is uh, the, a, a cord just going to the ignition within the unit. Um, up there is an exhaust flue. And then here we have the, uh, the feeder and return pipes for the system. So it looks like there's a lot of pipes, but actually there's just really um, a feed and return to the system to each panel. It's a cycle, so um, yeah, it's very good. And tell me, is it a comfortable heat? Oh, Charlotte, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it's a really a soft, sweet, gentle heat, you know, um, not too harsh. Um, and um, there's no draft or dust to worry about, which is nice. Mm. And, and is it expensive or? Um, well, I consider it an investment, you know. I mean, the installation of the, the panels and the piping and everything is quite expensive to start off with, but then once it's installed, it's really, really efficient and actually quite cost effective. So last year, I think it cost me about $915 for the whole year, which was pretty good. Um, but this year I'm planning on doing some zoning. So, you know, I'm going to section off and only heat off, heat up rooms that I'm actually using. So I'm hoping that'll save me another 25%. And then worst case scenario, I've got a couple of other options to also um, further save uh, efficiency as well. What are those options? Well, I could, for instance, install a solar hot water system on the roof. Um, so and use that to heat the water. Um, which would be really good. Even on cloudy days, you could preheat the water, if you even if you have to use the burner a little bit to, 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 um, to just top it up. Um, that, would be, that would be really efficient. And obviously also the benefit would be I could use that water for showers and things like that. Or I could change the heating system without even touching the, the pipes and panels and everything inside, just change to use like a heat pump or a wood fire burner or even geothermal. Oh, wow, and I've heard a bit about in slab hydronic heating. Have you? Did you ever consider this option? Oh, that's a great question, Charlotte. Yeah, I did. So, you know, we looked at it, but when we made the extension here, we built it on stilts. Um, so, um, you know, we to put in a concrete slab, it would have required a much bigger footing, and it's a lot more expensive. The the pipes or coil within the floor is very expensive. So. Um, we, for us, it was just too expensive. But the other thing is, you know, we're here in Melbourne and Melbourne has this crazy weather. It's up and down, especially in the shoulder seasons, like spring and autumn, you know, Monday's 25, Tuesday's 26, and then Wednesday's five degrees. Um, the problem is that the concrete slab is not very responsive. It takes about 24 hours to heat up and another 24 hours to cool down. So it's not so good for those temperature fluctuations. Whereas the hydronic panels, they can heat a room in about two hours. So it's a lot better. But you know, if I did build another house that had a slab, I think I would put in a hydronic slab heating. Why? Well, it's just so efficient, you know, it has such a large thermal mass. Um, it's 
it, it's really nice heat. So, if, for instance, especially in winter, if you had a solar hot water system on the roof, um, it would heat it up during the day, and then you get this really nice, even, radiant, consistent heat in the evening. Yeah, all night through. Wow. Well, thank you for showing us your system. It's been absolutely riveting. Um, yeah, thank you. My pleasure, Charlotte. Yeah, thanks. Um, this is Charlotte O'Cream reporting for EBS TV. Back to the studio. Hello, Homer. Can you tell us about your heating system? Uh, I'm just a big toasty cinnamon bun. I never want to leave this bed. Thank you, Charlotte, and thank you, Mr. Water, for sharing your great heating system and your talent in playing ukulele. So, let's summarize the pros and cons for hydraulic system with panels. Pros, reactive and potentially cheap to run according to the type of energy chosen. Gives relatively accurate heat, no draft, with moderate maintenance and zoning is possible. However, it is intrusive, expensive to install, but you can change the type of energy. You can heat only small space, so you would need several panels to heat a big space. Hydraulic in slab. Pros, it is non-intrusive, it doesn't impact your furniture layout. Lots of inertia due to the thermal mass of the slab, so it offers consistent temperature. Cons, it is not a reactive system. Expensive to install, but potentially cheap to run according to the type of energy chosen. You can change the type of energy. You can heat big space and zoning is possible with thermostat in each room. And now to draw that on a plan, the magic pen. Magic pen!
Thanks, Magic Pen. And now let's go back to Albert Duduvet, who is meeting with Mrs. Duct. Hi, this is Albert Duduvet, and we are here at the beautiful house of Mrs. Duck. Hi, Mrs. Duck, thanks for having us. So, could you describe the heating system that you have here? Well, actually, in this house, uh, Albert, we have two heating systems. We have central ducted heating, and then we also have a wood fireplace. That's interesting. Why would you have two heating systems? Uh, well, when we bought the house, the central gas system was already in there, mm -hmm. but I wasn't a big fan because um, I have allergies, and so I found that it made my throat and my nose very dry, my eyes. So the other thing is also that we have so many dead trees and falling wood around the property that it sort of seemed to make sense to get a wood fireplace. Right, so do you still use the central heating system? Oh, look, we do sometimes. If we get home late at night in winter and it's very cold, because the house has a very low thermal mass, it doesn't retain heat very well. So we do sometimes put on the gas heating for 10 or 15 minutes while we light the fire. And then once it's nice and toasty and warm, we can turn it off. And the, uh, the whistling of the vents is replaced by a nice crackle of a fire. <gasps> that sounds lovely. Um, so by the sounds of it, with that central heating system, the ducted system, with all the dust and the noise and the draft, that doesn't really make it a really appealing system? No, I suppose not, but then it is very cheap. It's very cheap to install, certainly, especially if you have a house like ours, which is on stilts and on a slope, because mm -hmm. it's very easy to access the underside of the house. Yeah. And let, let me show you the furnace here. So this is where the air comes in here. You can see, so that's the air intake. It comes down into the chamber here where the gas, which runs through this pipe down here, runs in, burns, and then heats that air. And the electrical cord you can see runs down to a fan inside the unit, which then blows the hot air out through this ducting and up into the house. Now you can see there that the ductwork is insulated and that, that stops the air from cooling down as it travels up to the house. At the end of all the ducts are vents and those go into the rooms, um, which diffuses the air into the house. And the vents are adjustable so you can open and close them to allow more or less air in. But then we actually find that all it does is increases the amount of noise, to be honest, if you close the vents down. So we tend to leave them open. Um, it does mean that the system is not really zonable. Mm -hmm. So you can't change to have different temperatures in different parts of the house. But that, that would be a little bit annoying, right? If you can't properly zone the house? Well, I guess it is, but it's certainly cheap. Yeah, I understand. Well, can you show me your uh, wood fire heating? Certainly. <laughs> Not now, Ali. This is mummy's moment. So, this is your wood fire burner? Yes, yes. So, look, it's a fairly conventional model. Cast iron with two metal skins with brick fill in between. Um, you can see we have a kettle on top here where we keep hot water topped up. So, we've always got some for tea. That's great. You don't usually see heating system that you can also cook with. Mm. Um, so how, how expensive is it to run and how convenient is it? Oh, well, we've, I mean, we've been here for 10 years and we've never had to buy any wood. So it's essentially free, I guess. I mean, I guess the, the real disadvantage is that it's not automated. You can't just press a button and the heat comes on. Um, and because the house has a fairly low thermal mass, it does get quite chilly in the mornings. You also have to clean out the ash. Um, but then it's really good to go on the garden and um, well, I guess you have to chop wood as well but then that saves you a gym membership. <laughs> All you need to do is take the wheelbarrow and an axe down. Way! Winter is coming. Right, so I'm guessing that for someone who lives in the city like me, a system like that would not be very convenient. Uh, well, you know, maybe not this exact model, but if you wanted to, you could use a wood pellet burner, which is really awesome. Mm. So do you know how, how they work? Well, they look very similar, but essentially they have a feeder of wood pellets, which are made from compressed sawdust. And it also has an electric ignition and a timer. So you can set it to start and stop whenever you want. It's really like the best of both worlds. It's amazing. Wow. Well, that's great. Thanks a lot, Mrs. Dirk, for all that information. And thanks for having us. My pleasure. Um, this is Albert Duduve, back to studio. But I tell you, she looks like Mr. Water. You're wrong. Thank you, Miss, Mrs. Dirk. 
Um, let's see the pros and cons of central gas heating system. Central gas heating system pros are the installation cost is cheap and it's relatively cheap to run as there is a high reactivity and low maintenance. However, the heat quality is quite poor because it's drafty, noisy, dusty and definitely to avoid if you've got allergies. L relatively poor inertia depending on the thermal mass of the house and the impact of the furniture layout is big as you can't put furniture above the vents and it is also a difficult system to zone so no zoning for this system. Of course it is also not possible to install this system if you've got a slab on the ground. And please magic pen how to draw this system on a plan Magic Pen! Thank you Magic Pen and now let's have a look at our last report about heating systems with Charlotte Cream meeting Mr. Split. Okay. This is such a beautiful view. Yes. Hello, this is reporter Charlotte O'Cream and I'm in this beautiful apartment to talk to Mr. Split about his heating system. Yeah, yes, this is my apartment. Fantastic. Now tell me about your heating system. This is a Fujitsu C 6.0 kilowatt H7.2 kilowatt reverse cycle split system. What does that mean? Um, well, it means that it's able to provide six kilowatts of cooling or 7.2 kilowatts of heating. Fantastic. And now tell me, how does that work? Well, uh, it's probably a little complicated for you to understand, but essentially it transfers heat from the outside to the inside. This little unit down here takes in heat and transfers it through to this unit, which heats the space. Fantastic. Now tell me, does it use a lot of energy? Mm, no. Because it uh, doesn't create heat, but transfers it through a phase change in the refrigerant, uh, it doesn't use a lot of energy. In fact, it uses 3.65 times less than an electric panel heater, so it's quite economical. Fantastic. Now tell me, is it comfortable? No. Um, wh why? Why isn't it not comfortable? Because it produces a draft, which is not very nice. 
mm. and it's quite noisy. Um, the advantages are that it's quite swift to heat the room, it takes about two minutes. And because there are multiple units in different rooms, it is zonable. It costs $914 last year to heat the apartment. Oh, thanks for that precise answer. Now tell me, is there any way you can reduce the costs or upgrade the system? Not really. I'm hoping when this one ends its life cycle, there will be a better replacement, a more efficient replacement. They usually last around 10 years. Okay, thank, thank you. Thanks for explaining that to me, yes, and inviting us into your apartment. This has been Charlotte O'Cream reporting for EBS TV. Back to the studio. Thanks Charlotte and thanks Mr. Split. You're legend. Let's summarise the pros and cons of the reverse cycle split system. Reverse cycle air conditioner. They are cheap to install and quite cheap to run. The reactivity is very high with a moderate maintenance. However, the cooling quality is quite poor as it is drafty and noisy it could even be smelly if the filter is dirty. The impact of the furniture is different than other systems as the unit will be uh, installed on the wall. But you need to have access to the outside unit. So typically in Melbourne, apartment will have balcony mostly to accommodate the outside unit. Zoning is possible as each unit will be in each room with its own thermostat. And now, the magic pen, to know how to draw that on a plan. Magic pen! Thanks for watching this first episode of EBS TV. It was heating for residential building. Stay warm. Okay, that's finished.